Good morning. Good morning. All right, everybody is awake this morning. Uh, it's good to see everyone this morning. I want to welcome all of you that are tuning in online. Uh, good to be able to come together on a nice sunny day. And uh, you know, I mean, it's not fall yet, but you know, it's sunny, so I like it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to enjoy the last, well, I don't know how many days it's going to be hot, but I'm going to enjoy that because I love fall, but I don't like winter. So I'll just enjoy every season that I can. But we know that there's a reason for every season, and uh, I am so glad that uh, we serve a God who created each and every season because he is great, he is mighty, he is awesome, Amen. and we want to worship him this morning. So let's stand together and sing, How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
Father God, you are great, you are mighty, and you are awesome. And Lord, we just give you all glory, honor, and praise this morning. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who you sent to live a perfect life and to pay the price of our sins on Calvary, but not to stay in the grave, but to conquer death. And that today we serve a risen Savior, Lord. And I thank you so much for that. And Father, I just pray that you bless this service this morning. As we lift up our voices to you, as we hear the word open to us, Father, I just pray that we be receptive and that we just glorify and worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Because he is indescribable. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea.
All the people said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Continuing to worship this morning, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. Thy word. to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid and I think I've lost my way, take the opportunity each and every week to partake of the Lord's Supper together. So as we prepare for communion, let's be singing, Lead Me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget. Yes. 
Good morning. Good morning. I think this meditation will dovetail nicely with that song. Well, through the first eight days of school, my classroom and the west wing of our building has been without AC. Some days it hasn't been too bad. Other days it's been rough, to the point where I've had students walk in and say, your room is blazing. <laughs> I thought, yeah, there's been some uncomfortable days. And then I started thinking about classrooms in Haiti. I quickly came to the conclusion that they would trade classrooms in a heartbeat. They would love to deal with just a little heat and have all the opportunities that we have here. Then I started thinking about this time of communion. I'm pretty sure that Jesus was uncomfortable on the cross. Luke 22, 41 to 44, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He knew what going to the cross uh, entailed. However, even if he wanted it another way, he did it the Lord's way and went to the cross for us. He died in our place for us. And this is what we remember at this time of communion. We eat the bread that represents his body, drink the juice that represents his blood, to remember his sacrifice. He loves us so much that he was willing to die in our place. And then I finally thought, uncomfortable is probably too light a word for hell, but Jesus saved all who came to him from an eternity of uncomfortableness. When we encounter those uncomfortable days that we're going to encounter, let's remember what Jesus went through for us, how he made himself uncomfortable so that through the gift of grace, and his sacrifice, all who come to him can look forward to an eternity that will have every comfort imaginable. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, as we come to this time of communion to remember what you did for us, what you put yourself through so that we would have an opportunity to be in heaven with you through the bridge that you created for us, pray that as we eat the bread and drink the juice that we remember what it entails, remember what you put yourself through, and that we use that as we go through the week to try and share your love and your grace with those we come in contact with. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As we continue worshiping together, let's all stand and let's sing, Send Me Out. Every 
You can be seated. Every time I ask Mark to swap meditations because I'm not going to be here next week, we do send me out <laughs> before my meditation. Just, it that way. Yeah. <laughs> what a great song to do when there's like 80 people out there. So that's awesome. Feels good. Um, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Yesterday... Uh, Carrie and I spent the morning at uh, Newark Heath Airport. Um, they had a fly-in event that honored Vietnam veterans, with, and they have various displays and exhibits around. And I know Jim and Diane were there as well. I saw them. Uh, the Traveling Vietnam Memorial Wall was set up there. It's a smaller version of the full-size memorial that's in Washington, D.C., and it honors those who gave the ultimate sacrifice during the Vietnam War and never came home. The event looked to me to be very successful for such a small airport. Uh, there were a lot of people there, uh, and you could get tours of some pretty cool airplanes. They were doing rides on B-25 bombers from World War II and a Huey helicopter from the Vietnam era. Uh, there was a small, there was almost a small disaster, though, when they had to reposition the helicopter to put gas in it. Um, the fuel pumps are located right where most of the booths are set up and where the crowd was. And uh, so they had to hover taxi it over there, and I saw a couple hats blown off heads. <laughs> the tent that they were selling tickets for the B-25 rides uh, almost tumbled down the flight line. I've got it all on video. It's pretty funny. <laughs> and nobody would get out of the way of a hovering helicopter. It was really weird. <laughs> One of the other things I noticed at the event was the number of booths set up for organizations that give back to veterans. Of course, the Licking County Veterans Administration Service Center was there. Uh, Columbus Honor Flight, which takes vets from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam to Washington. Um, to visit the memorials, had a booth set up. I saw a couple of organizations that take disabled vets on outdoor trips, like hunting and archery at no cost to the vet. One of those organizations, Outdoors for Veterans, uses the lodging at Round Lake Christian Camp to take vets on hunting and fishing trips. They're in the process of building their own lodge right, right near Round Lake. And of course, all, these all of these organizations were asking for donations. Seeing the sacrifice symbolized by the memorial wall and the many organizations whose mission it is, to give back to those who have sacrificed so much got me thinking about what it is that we do here at church every week. Communion time and offering time are inextricably, inextricably connected with worship. We sing praises to our God, remember his sacrifice, and we give an offering every week. Why do we give an offering back? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16, 17, or 16, 17 gives a reason, and while we're not required to follow all of the laws laid out in the Old Testament is still, I think, a valid reason. It says, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord, your God, has blessed you. This was a directive related to the various festivals the Israelites were required to celebrate, but the reasoning still applies. Outdoors for Veterans takes vets on week-long hunting and fishing trips at no cost to the vet for any of it, simply because of the sacrifice that vet was willing to make to the country and because Outdoors for Veterans realizes the blessings we have in our country due to that sacrifice. How much more has the Lord blessed all of us with his sacrifice? 
Shouldn't our offerings reflect that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the time to gather and worship and sing praises to you. And Father, thank you for the time to reflect on your word and to reflect on the sacrifice you've given for us and the ways that we might give back through the blessings you've given us. Father, please be with those that give today, be with those offerings as they um, further your kingdom, not only here in Alexandria, but in Ohio and around the world. And Father, just bless those that give and the offerings themselves. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. We are going to be praying together. I have two or three updates I could share. We would appreciate it if you would be remembering Wayne Lashley. Uh, Wayne is Charlotte Lee's brother who is back in the hospital after open heart surgery six weeks ago. So appreciate your prayers for Wayne. And also, if you would lift up uh, Ellie Phillips' brother, Edward. Uh, Ellie, or Edward, Edward has a cardiologist appointment here soon. Um, that doctor is going to be the guy that decides if he's ready for a, a heart uh, bypass surgery that he desperately wants and needs. So appreciate your prayers for Edward's visit. And for those who are the... The oldest time, how do you say it, the old timers, the original members, the pre-us people even, um, you will remember Chuck Lees, who was the original, uh, the first minister of our congregation, and Chuck passed away uh, this past week. So do ask that you would remember the Lees family in their loss. And, um, other updates, changes? Karen? Okay. Okay. Karen's dad, George, who is having very high risk uh, surgery to replace, work on degenerative discs in his neck that'll need two days at Ohio State. So keep that in prayer. Elaine? Okay. Uh, okay. 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 All right. Remember Bentley and add that if you would to what we had for his fractured back and the brain damage and his family. Diane. Yes, we are praising and grateful that now everybody's gonna turn around, and stare. She's back in the back and she's waving in the very back corner. So we are glad that Sue could be back with us. Very good. Else. Yeah, just be forewarned on the flock notes prayer request. I'll try to remember. If I have access to a picture of you, I will add that. So just if you want to contribute a different one, feel free. But you know, that's that's what we're gonna do. Try to try to put a name with a face. So, um, and I will just encourage you, uh, whether you know the individuals or not, just use this time. Let's be praying individually and, and privately, and then I'll close. We come before you, Father, just continuing to ask that your, uh, your strength, your guidance, uh, your plan and purpose would be made evident in uh, the lives of all of these that we know and love, family members who are struggling or recovering, uh, both those who are grieving uh, a loss. And we are grateful for those times when we can have that confidence and, and uh, peace of knowing that um, loved ones are home with you for eternity. We pray that you would continue to keep our hearts and minds open as we study the word, as we pray and sing and share and give and just uh, participate in a time of uh, worship and teaching that we can be uh, protected, uh, guarded against that in the world, which is untrue. Uh, we pray that we would recognize the attacks, the, the plots, the lies, uh, the deceit that 
Satan brings at us every day. Thank you for being able to share with one another, to spend time together, to encourage whether we're within these walls or, or beyond through the week. Uh, we continue to ask your blessing and strength upon uh, the hands and the hearts, the health, uh, the efforts of our missionaries around the world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. What's the difference is the title this morning. We'll start with a few before and after examples. Uh, the first two are from the recent flooding in the Yellowstone National Park area. Be aware of the bridge. That's the before picture. You can see the bridge in the center. And the after picture shows where that bridge no longer exists. Uh, this next set is someone's, I think, basement, maybe garage. There's nobody here in our congregation, but here's the before. Okay. And the after. That's what you get. Two pairs that Kathy Imps shared with me. The first two are the ferns uh, before <laughs> and then after. And this set here, what, what's the before? Okay, it's not matches. With the after, you would recognize those as seeds. Those were the seeds before. And this next one, it just needs to stay side by side on the screen to appreciate this. Here's the before haircut picture and the after. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there, and, and there, there's, a, there's a real sense where all of everything, time, history, is before and after Jesus. Okay? Even for people who aren't Christian, uh, they, they have to wrestle with the Bible saying that he sustains all of nature by his power. Colossians 1, 16, 17. Um, they deal with some of his very memorable words that are used in everyday speech, like daily bread, uh, judge not, uh, do unto others. No. Calendars in, in the Western world date from the approximate time of his birth. No. The impact of Jesus. So love for the Lord has motivated his people to establish schools, orphanages, nursing homes, hospitals. I started thinking of hospitals in our area, St. Anne's, Riverside Methodist. David Faust asked, have you ever heard of a hospital called Atheist General? There's <laughs> no such thing. You know? um, Jesus has impacted art, music, literature, law. You know? he's, cha he's changed history, un unlike any other person. And what we're going to do this morning is kind of bring this down to a little bit more personal level. What do those timestamps mean in our lives, B.C., A.D.? Uh, perhaps this, the suggestion from David Faust, before Christ and after deciding. You know, my life before Jesus, and then I accepted him after deciding. Changes everything again, right? Changes my priorities, how I spend my money, use my time, career choices, the way we see people, hopefully, changes our family. He changes the future. It's the same concept. It's the same framework. We're going in this next part of the letter of First Peter, and kind of that's Peter's framework. Before Jesus, I was this, and now after Jesus, my, my life is this way. And it's, it's kind of a common point of view for Peter throughout this book. And I'm going to give you a list of some other what, what we'll call B.C. and A.D. examples. And be aware, um, I put the graphic, if you have the paper insert in your hand or online or something, I put the graphic, just a straight screenshot, right on the back of the insert. So you don't have to write all this down. But for those who don't have or can't see, here are the examples. Before Christ, 114 says, you followed evil desires and lived in ignorance. After deciding, 14 and 15, you strive for obedience and holiness. B.C., you had an empty way of life. A.D., you've experienced new birth and have a living hope. You are not a chosen people. You are the people of God. You had not received mercy. You have received mercy. You were like sheep going astray. You have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You wasted time doing what pagans do. 
You can spend your time doing more worthwhile things and lasting things as you fulfill the word of God. You know? Those are changes. And, and all of those changes that come because of the salvation, that's what we talked about last week in chapter 1, verse like 3 to 12. And if you have your Bible open to 1 Peter 1, 13, the first word is therefore. That's the link. You know, therefore, it links the first half of the chapter to the, to the second half. Therefore, because of my salvation, because of everything that Jesus did, my new life looks like this. Before Jesus, I acted this way. After deciding, I act like this. So that's what we're looking at. What, what are some of those before and after differences? Like, like the first example is this. Obedience replaces disobedience. And this is 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore... Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Be, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. So, and please keep this passage open on your Bible, your devices will go back to... First Peter periodically. But Jesus changed everything. Changed the way I think, the way I act. Um, I, David Faust had a good example. Like when they change a road or they, they move a stop sign, <laughs> you have to learn to stop where you didn't and start. And I started thinking of, of those types of changes around here. You know, sometimes they'll put up a new signal and, and it'll be blinking for a while and they give you a note. You know, signal's going to go into operation in 30 days. Be ready. I had to learn to stop out here where there used to be a blinking caution and then some of us can remember the first time you had to use Moot's Run to get here. You know, the, the whole road was changed. Well, I don't think about it now, but we kind of have a before Moot's and after Moot's <laughs> world, you know, and that's what, that's what a lot of us do now. You just close your eyes and, and just try to wrap your head around what the Intel ripple effect is going to do to our roads, to a two-lane road that will now be a four-lane road or a five-lane road or more. And this can, this can be a process. It, it can be a kind of a struggle to, when you're learning to stop this and, and start that. And I'm trying to follow Jesus. And Paul was very faithful, but he would admit that there's a struggle. Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. <clears throat> I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. You know? And a little side note, we're talking this section about being obedient and, and children and, and people who had, especially like abusive parents or, or difficult upbringings, that, that you struggle with, with this wording, you know, of being obedient like a child. But we're going we're to be on that track, the obedience track, if we can develop these. I'll go ahead and put three up there. If I could develop a ready mind, an obedient heart, a willingness to strive for holiness, that's going to look different from the world. Um, a ready mind, that's what Peter says in 13. Prepare your mind for action. And this, if you had the King James translation in front of you, you'd be wrestling with that phrase, gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, and it comes from Exodus and the picking up the folds of their robe and tucking it into their belt, gird up so you can run. I look for a picture of a mom in a bathrobe chasing a school bus. You know, it's kind of that same pick up your robe so you can, in, in urgency. That's what it is. Whatever your translation is, um, the contemporary English has be alert and think straight. And the message says, put your mind in gear. You know? I don't know if you've ever gotten up in the morning, you just, you just didn't put your mind in gear. <clears throat> you sit down and take a test. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I, I'm not thinking straight. You know? I'm just saying it. Let's, let's be honest. It takes some brain power, some, some intentional effort to follow Jesus. It does. Lazy minds are just not willing to... There's some tough choices, hard challenges, stuff we got to discuss. Uh, the, the concept of Bob serving as a stand-to-reason outpost director. You know, it's exactly what this is about, being able to provide and equip my mind. We're, we're asking for... You, I got to have some mental self-discipline. Love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, and mind. It's going to come to that in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Your mind. We are gearing up for another scripture memorization challenge in September. 
really, it's not that hard, okay? This is not a huge one. I'm, I'm telling you, yeah, there's a page out there. You can look at it. It's like one front side, or maybe a little bit on the back. I counted it up. It's 389 words total. We're giving you a month, okay? Little bite-sized sections. Each, this, week, this week told you now what the date's going to be, what the words are going to be. Do I want to do the work? We got a couple of guys who are preparing to be, give their first meditation. They'll be coming up soon. You'll see them. And one of them knows when his Sunday is. You know, we were out in some other conversation, different context, and a date was mentioned. He goes, "Oh, that's my day." I said, "What are you talking about? That was my day to have a meditation, preparing his mind now." For that day. And both those guys, those people, others, that's the example of the obedient heart. Parents love this. We all know. It. Parents love it when a child is obedient. Right? So does God. Proverbs 23, 15. My son, if your heart is wise, then my heart will be glad. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Peter said in 14, 114, as obedient children. And how many people today just question authority? Ignore it, mock it. You can't tell me what to do. David Faustin, when's the last time Time magazine had the man or woman of the year on the cover and the byline said, she obeyed God. And yet yeah, the church strives to be, we, the term used to be seeker sensitive. You know, you're trying to think about what people are looking for, but you still have to worship John 4 in spirit and in truth. If you love me, John 14, keep my commandments. This is love, to obey his commands. And we're trying to understand what, what are the commands that God wants me to follow. Um, you can illustrate it with time when the kid doesn't understand the terminology. Like Think like three-year-old brain. Well, and the parent comes out, click, 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 click. Oh, the car is dead. They start to cry. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not... Not dead, you know, or if you, a little kid and the parent says, I'm going to have to jump the car. <laughs> the kid's thinking, this will be rich. You know? It's like, I don't think she's going to make it, but we'll, we'll see what happens. You, know? you take the kid to the doctor, you've you got to get a shot in the arm, and you know what's coming. <clears throat> you know? And I know why you're hurting, but trust me. Trust and obey. You know? I'm a child of God. I trust his word. I obey his commands. Holiness, like God. Holy nonconformity. We all know this. Obedience really is anything but dull. <laughs> really. Do, do not conform, verse 14. Or Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Conformity, be fit in a crowd. You know, sometimes it's yes, no. Um, I'll give you three uh, Senior class pictures, 1965. Notice the hairstyles, the clothing, pretty much the same. Then we go forward to 1985. Notice the difference. You can't read the names. I, yours truly, bottom right, blue suit, lots of hair. <laughs> that, that is my senior class. 2015. Yeah. Fashions change, hairstyles change, and there's some stuff like that. We, yeah, it's not a big issue. I go with it. And sometimes we draw a line and say, no, I'm not going to. What conformity as a Christian we're talking about, I conform, verse 15, to the character of God. Be holy, because he's holy. Sometimes we want to compartmentalize this. I got my Sunday life. And no, it's be holy in every, every aspect. Uh, we didn't read 17 yet, but he's talking about being strangers here in what Peter calls reverent fear. It's not reckless, but be reverent. It is possible to be reverent and relevant today. I don't think anybody appreciates a doctor or a pilot who doesn't take the serious nature. You know, lives are at stake here. Please don't be casual about this. Why, why would I think oh, I can just be casual with God? You know, true reverence is the natural result that I take God seriously. What is the difference in my life now? One of them is obedience has replaced disobedience. Another one is that freedom has replaced futility. 
<clears throat> I'm reading from verse 18 of 1 Peter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. We have been redeemed. We had we salvation. We looked at that last week. Uh, Jesus paid the debt. Um, been redeemed, what Peter calls in verse 18, an empty way of life. Vain, futile, worthless unfulfilling. I'm not, I'm not going to ask for examples. Have you ever had a time in life, work, where you just kind of felt unfulfilled? <laughs> One author said, it's, it's the world's empty way of life that leads even rich and famous people to commit suicide. Yeah. And tradition has some value. He talks about the empty way of life that was handed down from, from your father's you know, I got to examine my heritage, tradition. What does scripture say? Uh, I read where it said, you may have been raised in a faith, but it could still be an empty way of life. And you read some of this, like silver and gold aren't perishable. They don't, well, compared to Jesus, compared to his love, compared to his blood, they are. The great cost, the blood of Christ. <clears throat> if, you, if you've seen this Mandalorian TV series or media series, you know that Grogu is sought by, he's the one on the right, okay? He's, he's the little green one, you know? Why are people looking for Grogu? And I have my own theories. I'm not real deep in this universe, but I did look some online this week, and it pretty much matched up. You have Moff Gideon, who is the imperial bad guy, okay? And he is after Grogu, and he wants to extract something from Grogu and use it for probably nefarious purposes, they refer to our cute little friend as the donor. Okay. I think they're after the midi chlorians, these, these little microscopic organisms that are, they're the source of the force. You know, may the force be with you. You know, the more midi and Grogu has a lot of them in his blood. And I thought, man, look at that. Even the fictional world of George Lucas understands there's power in the blood. <laughs> you, know? <clears throat> you know, and G... Peter describes Jesus in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's the work of Jesus. It's through the work of Jesus, verse 21, that we believe. The best argument for God is the existence of Jesus. It's his miracles, his teaching, his example, his sacrifice. It's Colossians 2.9. We could put up John 1, 14 and following, or Philippians 2, 5. This is John 14, 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Um, here's Jesus as the artist in 1994 felt he would look. I don't know if that'd be like his senior class picture if he was 1994. This is, this is a shot of the cover of the December issue of Life magazine, 1994. And the question faded in there is, who was he? Who was Jesus? They're trying to, and, and David Faust chuckled. He said, the magazine title answers their own question. It says life right on the thing. <laughs> you know, who is he? He's life. It's right there on your own magazine. You know, G Jesus is giving us life that is actually truly freeing. So I don't, if, if you ever get tired of what is a shallow, selfish, surface relationship, the, the key is here. To, to love deeply, verse 22, from the heart. Which I know, sometimes you, oh, oh, sure, you're talking to Peter, sure. I hear you. Sounds so easy. But my brother, or my husband, <laughs> is a big jerk. Okay, you, you do know that, right? And how do I, you know, it's, it's 
love one another deeply. How do I do that? And you circle back to the first one in obedience and doing what Jesus tells me to do. Every time I have a premarital couple in my office, they're going to get the same speech, watch the same videos, and they're going to be told about this reward cycle you know, that is basically saying, you look at the Lord, sometimes past your spouse. You, know, you do the loving thing, you do the respectable thing, and your spouse may not respond immediately. They may not reciprocate ever. But beyond them, Jesus will see it and appreciate the loving effort. That's, that's your best hope. Peter is very good at contrasting. You want, we can do life the way Jesus set it up, or we can do what the world is suggesting. I, it's, I get that question a lot. You know? I, I know what the Bible says, and morality should be this, but man, the world this. I'm like, this is the heart of it. Okay? <laughs> there are two options you can choose. Peter says that, that the grass withers <laughs> this season. We're thinking eventually, you know, <laughs> at some point, the grass will stop growing. Oh. The flowers will fade. The weeds will die. We are freed to work on stuff. It's not futile. This is eternal. And the other list that's on the back of your insert already for you, um, if you watch these things online and it, we go too quickly, you, you can pause and, and go back. But here's a comparison. Number one. Evil desires now no longer control us, 114. We're free to bear good fruit. You'd find that in Galatians 5, 22. Empty traditions no longer rule over us. We're free to serve God from the heart. Hopelessness no longer weakens us. Now our faith and our hope are in God. Selfishness no longer confines us. We develop a sincere love for others. Death no longer destroys us. We enjoy new life through living in the enduring word of God. That's the difference. And there's, I don't know, you can see in those, there's a moral code. There, there's a foundation that is being established. And again, it goes with, here's the Lord's, here's the world's. Um, Scott McKnight in his book, he illustrated with TV talk show hosts. I think contemporary podcast is the same thing. A lot of those, the bread and butter is to kind of venture into the ethical issues you know, they'll talk about homosexuality, abusive husbands. He had a list, tattoos, losing weight, confronting your boss. They talk about this stuff, right? And the host and the guest will very easily slide from this moral dilemma to their moral stance without reflection of how they got there. <laughs> or what, what are you basing that on? That's, that's one of our great questions. How did you come to that conclusion? You know? And he said, you know, the more aware you are of this fact, the more readily, he's deep, deep in media, right, deep down in, in things that we see in here, is the belief in the essential goodness of human beings. You know, or at least the hope for it. That's what I say. If you just dig down deep enough, if we just try a little bit harder, if we discipline our lives, this, this is the argument, we, we'll, we'll make the world better. We make good choices. And sometimes you're like listening, like mid-show, and your phone will come up with an alert that says there's been another shooting or another suicide bombing. You're like, this whole argument dissolves on its face because people are jerks. You know? And they said any theory of ethics that assumes humans are somehow inherently good, and if they're simply educated, they'd begin, begin to behave in a morally decent way. You said, well, that's about as believable as fill in your fictional holiday character. And most of society, most people base their moral code on a consensus of a group that they believe to be rational people. So that's your first problem. <laughs> you might not be dealing with a rational group. You know? But they said to assign moral absolutes that apply to everybody, that just doesn't compute. That's beyond their capabilities. And here's Peter reminding us, you got to make a choice. You, you have been redeemed from a former way of life, verse 14, empty traditions, verse 18, you've been given new life, new hope, last week, verses 3, 4, 5. You've been purified, 22. All, all, all this is, it comes from God. These are God's standards, God's morals, God's source, God's freedom. The freedom comes from God. C.S. Lewis said, you cannot make men good by law. And without good men, you can't have a good society. That's why we have to start thinking about morality inside the individual. When I wake up, do I, do I understand? I have freedom. I'm free in Christ. But I'm, I'm starting the day. Do I, do I have a yearning to do what <clears throat> God designed, created, 
inherently built me to do? There's a lot of people that are just shackled to the futility of a broken world. What's the difference? Freedom replaces futility. And the last one is that a new hunger replaces old habits. And I'm telling you now, we're going to change a Thanksgiving tradition a little bit. Hunger made me think of this this week. Food, lunch. Um, for a while now, we've had a church-wide Thanksgiving carry-in dinner. Carry-in meaning there's a sign-up sheet out there. You sign up, I'm going to bring this. And we've always done it on the first Sunday of November. It's like a tune-up for the holiday. You know? <laughs> Let's do this. This year, we're gonna, we need to, I want to move that from the first Sunday in November to the third Sunday, which is the 20th. I'm telling you now, November 20th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And then probably go back next year. You say, why, why are you messing it up? Because here's what, on the other hand, we've started this fifth Sunday potluck thing. If a month has five Sundays, potluck meaning you don't sign up. You just, everybody just brings what they want. You get what you get. You know, it's kind of a surprise. You know? But the next fifth Sunday is October 30th which is the last Sunday of October, and I thought, man, if we do the first Sunday in November, if we do back-to-back, -back, some people just don't have that kind of time. You know, they're like, we're too scheduled. We don't. I know some of you are thinking, oh, I'd stay every Sunday and eat. I don't, <laughs> you know. Some people are saying, please stop talking about lunch. I'm getting hungry. Let's move on, you know. So October 30th, space it out a few weeks. November 20th, come eat again, you know. Hun hunger is usually not something you have to, like, develop. <laughs> you know, it just comes. You know, it, it's just a natural thing. Hunger for God. Thirst for the things of God. Do I have that? Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And this is one of the very rare times when the Bible and I are going to ask you and encourage you to act like a baby. Usually I'm standing here telling you to grow up. The visual in the text, be like, verse 2, a newborn baby. Jesus used it. Jesus used a child. Be, you got to be childlike, Mark 10, to follow what God requires. In regard to evil, 1 Corinthians 14, be infants. There are times, that, and, and I know how challenging this can be, the, the Lord wants to transform us so that I'm filled with childlike innocence and purity instead of the malice and deceit and all that in verse 1. That is tough. It can be very difficult for some people. Right? Some of us have been around a lot of malice, and we've seen a lot of stuff. You know? That's why I'll, we always ask to please remember, pray for law enforcement, judges, lawyers, people who I think have to deal with more than their fair share of malice and deceit and the like. You know, it'd be a very difficult challenge for someone who operates in that realm day after day after day to put on this face and become like a baby, just be filled with innocence and purity. You know, it's, it's the power of God. He has renewed me. He has remade me. I told you about the little baby girl up at the dashing diner and she... Mom had the bottle, and she knew exactly what to do. The little tiny baby just handed her the Bible. She knew exactly what to do. They know how to operate it. Is it, is it, is it the mom's job? Is it the parent's job to make the kid hungry? <laughs> that, that just happens. You know? I don't know if kids are going, well, if you just made better food, I'd be more hungry. Uh, no, you know, your hunger comes. Uh, and he's talking about milk. Reasonable, simpler, nourishing Spiritual comfort food, if you want. You know, babies, babies want milk, and babies sometimes want milk in the middle of the night. And mom, dad, somebody has to make it happen, lose sleep. The church tries to find sources of nutrition, try to provide, try to grow. If you're saying, yeah, I'm not really hungry for the things of God, the, the prayer in Psalm 51:12 is to restore the joy of thy salvation. If, verse 3, 1 Peter 2, 3, you've tasted that the Lord is good. You know, hopefully you're not indifferent about the word. Do I have that? Do I, do I have a hunger for a life that is an ethic that's pleasing to God? When I wake up in the morning, I have all these freedoms and all this faith. Do I want to obey? Do I want to be nourished? Am I hungry for God? Here's a picture. Pretty much any, 
insert that Lazarus Fish sends us from Myanmar often has some type of food distribution photo. Bags and bags of rice in the yellow, uh, the orange boxes full of bottles of cooking oil. They deal with people who are hungry every day. And that hunger is not going to go away, right? Be before Jesus, after deciding, they're still going to have that physical hunger. Well, so do we. But do I likewise have a hunger for the word? What has changed before Christ, after deciding? What is the difference? You see the ones we've looked at. Obedience replacing disobedience. Freedom is replacing futility. A new hunger is replacing old habits. It, yeah, it is a work in process. No. But what difference do I demonstrate? That, that was me. That's not me anymore. Let's pray. Father God, we are reminded of potential uh, that exists in the word for us to be fed and nourished uh, to build this foundation that enables us to obey your truth uh, even if or when uh, others around us choose not to. Uh, we understand the distinction. Uh, we understand the, the struggle that comes with not conforming to the culture. But may we again appreciate all that is provided Thank you for those who have walked the walk, who have uh, been examples of faith, those who have uh, contributed to the, the earliest days of our congregation and its uh, establishment. We pray that we would continue to uh, sink the roots into your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we will continue to invite, challenge, encourage, remind uh, the pivot point, the, the line between the, the blue and the white there can be today uh, in the waters that are behind us. If you know that you need to make that decision, we encourage you. Let's stand together and we'll sing, O Come to the Altar.
Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing several items coming up. Sometimes you think you've already maybe signed birthday cards. They just get, re you know, new group out there. So there may be some cards out there for the resident kids at the uh, children's home that you haven't signed yet. There are week four updates for praying for the counties available already out there in their foyer. I'm trying to think what else. Uh, Bible study for men and women. You guys start. Yes, we start Thursday night at 7 o'clock here at the church. We're doing Unexpected by Christine Kane, um, and it's really going to be a good one. Um, I've read the first two chapters of the book, and I really hope that more people will join us. Women this Thursday, and guys, I think Saturday will be at Bob Evans. I think that's September 1st. It is. I think it's the 3rd. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we, we do thank you again for this opportunity that we have to gather together. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for your holiness. And Father, I just pray that you uh, help us to strive uh, to uh, do what you would have us to do. Father, to show your love, to show mercy, and Father, to reach out to those who are lost as we build each other up as well, Father, as iron sharpens iron. Father, I just pray that you be with us. Uh, as we uh, leave this place and go into our uh, Sunday school time as well, Father, just ask that you keep us all safe and uh, keep us all healthy. And we do lift all those up at this time who are just struggling, Father, whether it be physically, mentally, or spiritually. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, let's close this morning with the King is Coming. <laughs>
king. 